So Amisha, you started as an employee and today you are a very successful entrepreneur and you are partners with one of the most reputed organization, Prabhudas Liladhar, which is one of the oldest organizations since 1944, three years before the independence and you are today a partner with them. How do you feel and how was the journey? I feel good, but just on the way, not achieved or not arrived. <laughs> so I you believe that uh, travel is a continuous journey, right? Travel is a continuous journey and a long, long way to go. And just one more thing I'll add, because you're talking about my organization that is Prabhudas Liladhar. For the year 1516, we were amongst, we were chosen as one of the top 50 brands from Asia. Wow, 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 fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. And this I would like to say that she is one of the top 10 women entrepreneurs in India, which is such a large country. Of course, there are powerful women, but she also is one of them. And we feel proud about that, that we know one such proud, powerful lady in the country. So Amisha, you must have started very young into your job career. As soon as you became a chartered accountant, you are already on your way. So this is a very male dominated activity. Generally, I think 90% of the people involved in the stock markets are males. How did you feel entering into this line of business? Was it accidental or was it conscious decision? So entering the equity markets was definitely not my first choice. When I finished my chartered accountancy, my dream was to become a consultant uh, on corporate advisory, merger acquisition, etc. But uh, of course, my father and the whole family being into investments and markets, I was shown this as the door to enter uh, the world of my ambition. And as I entered, I realized that this is the life which anybody would envy to have because every day something is changing. You are so involved and how much you get to know about what is happening in the world, I fall in love with the line I chose. There. And you chose it. And you have expanded today to be an entrepreneur in the industry. How are you different in the industry compared to the others? As an entrepreneur, what are the decisions that you took differently which gave you quick success in this business? I think the only thing which I always kept in mind is what is it that is bothering my client? So initially when I started my journey, my clients were all the institutional clients, whether sitting in US or Asia or within India, and which development in their stock, which is bothering them, they want an answer for whether the, the management is doing right, whether the sector is doing right. And to get that answer, I was trying to find out ways, whether through channel checks, whether through conferences, whether through conversation, with the management or somebody who's advising management, that is what was appreciated and client always loved it. And that's how I got a very good beginning. Whenever a foreign investor comes into the country, large foreign in institutions which invest in developing countries like India, uh, what is the confidence that you give them? Because probably like how you want an advertising agency and you get a pitch from 10 people, they also be, would be doing similar things for uh, financial uh, investments. So how do you convince them then? What is the differentiating points that you convince them on? One is that, you know, when we have the largest economy in terms of, second largest maybe in terms of population, and the youngest economy, there can't be growth other than in India. Right. So that is the key thing which will continue in favor of India for a long, long time to come. So we always do a two-way uh, you know, mindshare journey of theirs. So one, we make them meet some of the policy makers to make them get that confidence that it is a very stable country. It's not what you keep hearing in media. It's much beyond that. And of course, then we take them micro down to which are the sectors where spending is happening and which are out of that the selective companies which are really geared up to gain out of this growth which is happening in the country and which is what as a combination really works well. So your competition also would be doing this. Like suppose if there is an XYZ institution Absolutely. wanting to invest uh, 200 million dollars in the country, they will go to 10 companies. One would be Prabhudas Leeladhar. Exactly. At that point of time, what is your qualifying point? So I think it's always the insights which you get which differentiates you. So my competition typically is not domestic broking houses. My competition is all global broking houses. 
and they have their uh, linkages all over, for example, a Morgan Stanley or a CSFB. So the clients have both the access and then to create an insight is what uh, clearly differentiates. So we have specialized in mid caps. So this industry typically works on research on how you can be better and uh, better in knowledge on which sectors to invest in. And for its the research, you need a very a good, strong talent pool. Absolutely. What are your methods of research when vis-a-vis -vis the other people in the industry? Uh, what is your strength of research? I think the industry at the moment is structured in terms of sectorial research, which is what is a must for uh, most of us as the broking houses. The differentiating factor that we try and bring for institutional investors is in terms of the focus being also equally and more on mid caps. Because uh, generally in a growing economy, if you catch some of the organizations young, then you make multifold money. So we have kept our focus as mid caps. So for the uh, knowledge of everybody, if you can just in one paragraph explain what is a mid, mid cap, cap and a large cap. Correct. So any stock which is under Nifty 50, that is the index, is typically a large cap. And any stock which falls out of that in terms of market cap, where the last thing uh, stops and is about 2,500 crores, is typically we call them as mid caps, which is where they then gain much larger growth over next some time, say 10 years or 5 years, as compared to the large caps, which is equally and big and dominating already. What has been more successful for you, investments in mid-caps or large-caps in terms of percentages in the last uh, 10 years? So it is of course mid-caps, but at the same time when the tides turn and uh, you know there was like the 2008 to 2010 period when the money was going out of the markets, then mid-caps also underperform and they suffer a lot because people have risk off. They want less risk, so they will go to liquid and more large corporations, then the, the mid-caps suffer a lot. But typically on a longish period, it is mid-caps who do much, give much better return. So India as a country has seen uh, two large scams. One is Harshad Mehta and in the 90s, in the early 90s, and second was Ketan Parekh. Whenever this scam takes place, how does investment companies sustain? Because when a scam takes place, the investigation, the impact, the after impact, it takes up a, a couple of years. During that period, everybody is scared of the stock market. Investments go down, foreign investors run away. During such times, when you operate with fixed costs and resources, how do you balance your existence and survival? Uh, you're very right. You know, actually, my seeds of being an entrepreneur without me realizing, were sown when the Ketan Parekh crisis happened. And uh, the fixed cost of my company was typically very high. I was leading the whole institutional team, uh, but the business had collapsed to 10% of what it used to be. Wow. And then we decided that, you know, instead of parting the team, uh, why not we cooperate with the company and we all took voluntary cut, I being the highest bid, I took the largest cut and allowed everybody else to decide what cut they are ready to take and we all stayed together and that gave us a tremendous chance to bounce back because within just nine months the scene had changed again and that's what happens in the market and as what you know you had also read out, in just next four to five years the business went up 36, 40 fold. So in I think six years time. In just six years' time. Just so I think this calamity was a big opportunity for you. Exactly. This calamity was biggest opportunity for you. Exactly. And that was a very voluntary and intuitive decision by me because I thought that it was not told to me by management that this is how we handle. I only thought that, you know, we are good. We are a good team. We are a good brand. And we are doing a good job. Why not to sustain for a while and allow this thing uh, to tide over? And that's where somewhere the management got confidence that I can see both the sides uh, more, clearly. more clearly. Fantastic. Uh, you have started a lot of new initiatives for the organization. Like Prabhudas Liladhar was the first broking firm to get a license from the Bombay Stock Exchange or National Stock Exchange? Way back. Way back. You are the first broking firm. 
and post that today when you talk about Prabhudas Leeladhar, you are into multiple activities. You are into institutional investments, you are into retail investments, you are into NBFC as well. Uh, were you responsible for the majority of the diversifications that happened in the last 10-12 years? Yeah, because oh, most of these were pretty interlinked activities. So when typically you want to recommend a stock, you know what the management is trying to do and what they need in the process of growing their business. So do they need some in equity or debt infusion in the process? So knowing that is a, you try to help corporate also positioning them well across the institutional investor, helping them raise money. So, so the corporate uh, advisory or investment banking business is a corollary to this business. How do, yeah. How do you do the introspection of the research that your team does? And who takes the final decision on what needs to be done forward? So of course now the organization is uh, pretty huge. It's about 350 people team. So a lot of things are delegated and there is a head of research, there are sectorial analysts, there are associates. Uh, but yes, in terms of now uh, screening where we focus in terms of sector and stocks, it still uh, comes to a core committee where I am one of the part, but a lot of things are delegated. So what are your core strengths as a leader in the organization? What are your core strengths? I think over the years, as what I keep hearing from my team members, uh, one of the core thing is that I have the skill which is required for the business, which is analyzing the business, understanding the business, and then positioning. Because you know, while most of us work for eight hours, 10 hours, and earn money, my typical job or my company's typical job is that your money work for you. And that has to be done at a very careful and measured way, not with a lot of aggression, and temper the aggression in investors. So that skill that we have, and then we, the second thing which probably I hear from a lot of my colleagues is that I don't keep my work for tomorrow. I work, I always finish my today's work today. Fantastic, fantastic. That's, that I think is a very, Good point to do because as entrepreneurs, we are very familiar with a word called procrastination. We always try to do today's work day to day after tomorrow. So you, you try to do it the same day. I'm sure that is one of the qualifying points. Uh, being a research-based business model, uh, you must be having a great talent pool with you. They must be engineers and chartered accountants and I am Ahmedabads and the works, the IITNs and the works. How do you do performance management with them? You know, the whole process, uh, it's not only in research, but research has to be sold. That means the client has to be convinced as to what you believe in. So sales is also equally important. And I have now two sets of clients. I have clients, institutional clients. I have large h &I and retail clients. We have about 80,000 retail clients across India. And I have corporates also as my client whom I have to educate whether they are upcoming or uh, you know, pretty large, that the biggest currency that you hold is your own company shares. You don't undermine that. And to really unlock the wealth, what you really need is transparency. So, Amisha, real estate affects the stock market, the stock market affects the gold market, the gold market affects the dollar market. How do you keep eyes on all these activities together at the same time? Because all are interconnected. That is absolutely true, but I think that the next 10 years phase in India is a phase very different from past 50 years phase when everybody was hoarding money rather than they had desired to grow their money. So while you were generating... Now nobody has money to hoard, demonetization. Exactly. So, <laughs> so the compulsorily a lot are of Are there money. any news that they are going to tap gold also? But even no. if they do, gold is a dead investment. You know, we want to hoard. We don't want to grow. That's why we keep latching onto it. That mentality is bound to change, trust me. Out of a country of 120 crores, there are still only 4 crore people who have either their mutual fund folios or their demet account. And I think over the next 5 to 10 years, I mean, not less than... Uh, five, but between five and ten years, this will grow multifold. US had a period when they grew 25 folds 
in a period of 15 years, I think we will do it in a much shorter time because of the technology disruption. Fantastic, fantastic.